So thank you for inviting me here today, and thank you for attending um, this, this talk. So I'm based in the Information School at the University of Sheffield in the UK. Uh, we have uh, a faculty of about <coughs> 22 academic staff, and we teach information management, librarianship, um, data science is, one of is our newest master's degree, uh, mostly teaching master's students. So my areas of interest are information literacy, information behavior um, as my core interests. And I'm interested in looking at these in different contexts. So for example, um, I and my PhD students are looking at what information literacy means to people in different uh, academic contexts, different disciplines. Um, also, we're looking at information literacy in different countries, such as Thailand, Syria, uh, Malawi, um, and looking at different types of information literacy, for example, in formal education or in the workplace. And also, I'm interested in looking at information literacy and information behavior in different kinds of virtual environments, like virtual worlds or online gaming. So I'll be mentioning some of these things as I go along. I'm going to start by giving some definitions of what I mean by information literacy and information behavior, and what I mean by blended information behavior. Um, I'm then going to be giving various examples of, um, from mostly from research um, studies, um, mine and other people's, looking at how people are using all kinds of different information nowadays. And so the idea of information literacy being uh, just about text is, um, I think, uh, not true anymore, if it was ever true. And then I'll be talking at the end about the need to educate people for this, this kind of information literacy. So that's kind of the topics I'm going to be covering in about the next um, 60 minutes. So the picture at the front um, is in the virtual world Second Life. I'm going to be mentioning Second Life in one of my s slides explicitly when I talk about a study of information behavior in Second Life, but also I tend to use pictures from Second Life to illustrate my uh, talks because I think they're attractive. So this is me um, on a, a roundabout in Second Life, um, <coughs> enjoying the autumn sunshine. So information behavior. And I've taken here a, a definition from Tom Wilson. Uh, this is partly because it's a very well-used definition. Uh, you'll see it in lots of books and articles. Also, Tom Wilson was a professor and head of department in my school, my high school, for many years, and he's still an emeritus professor. So we have a connection uh, with Tom Wilson and his tradition of information behavior research. So information behavior is the totality of human behavior in relation to sources and channels of information, including both active and passive information seeking and information use. And uh, <coughs> information sources and channels of information, and so it's not restricting it there to particular sources or channels. And he calls uh, it active information um, seeking and passive information seeking and information use. Um, I tend to be uh, use a word that was less um, passive than passive, in that I think people acquire information in various ways. I'm very interested in something called information encountering. So the idea that you acquire quite a lot of information by bumping into it. So you might not actually be looking for that specific information at the time, but you come across it um, and then you decide, oh, that's useful to me and I'll um, keep that information. So for example, I might be um, just browsing the internet for my own recreation and I come across an article that happens to mention something about information, I think it's relevant to information seeking, and I think, ah oh yes, that could be useful to me when I'm talking to my students about information seeking, and so I might bookmark the site or I might download something, uh, or otherwise try and make it retrievable later when I really want to use it. Or I might be sitting on a bus, um, as I do sometimes, to go into the department um, and be reading the free newspaper that um, was often copies on the bus and come across an article about um, social media and think, again, that, that might be interesting to use as a, a story or an anecdote with my students. And so I'm, I might take the free newspaper and um, file it somewhere. 
Um, although at the time I wasn't looking specifically for that. So that's information encountering. I've mentioned it at length because I'm someone who is a super encounterer. Um, I count on encountering information and I acquire quite a lot of information like that. And so older studies of information behavior tended to focus on people who are actively seeking information and mostly doing things like searching databases or searching catalogs. Um, but these Definitions of information behavior include all kinds of ways in which people are interacting with information. So going on to the idea of blended information behavior, <coughs> which I um, coined, and again, that's, my, that's me in Second Life. Um, I, I have blue hair in Second Life all the time. I have lots of different blue hair, but it's almost always blue. Um, blended information behavior, effective use of a variety of channels and sources, moving between digital uh, and online environments, and using a blend of techniques such as searching, browsing, encountering to meet a variety of needs and achieve the desired outcome. So it seemed to me that a characteristic of life nowadays for those who have access to online internet is that um, people are using online and offline sources and moving between them um, in quite sophisticated ways um, in order to um, do things in everyday life. Um, and this is coming up more in the research literature. But no one had called it blended information before, information before so I thought I'd, 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 I'd grab that term um, and use it. In terms of information literacy, um, Bill Johnston, um, who he's the one at the top, as I hope you'd recognize, and I'm the one at the bottom. Um, Bill Johnston and I have been working on information literacy for about 15 years now. We taught, uh, we were both working at Strathclyde University in Scotland at the time. And we developed a class for a credit bearing class for business school students in information literacy. And we're also obviously working with the information school students um, with information literacy, um, where I was at Strathclyde. Um, and we've continued to work together, although I moved to Sheffield and published and do research projects. And uh, in the early 2000s, we coined this definition of information literacy. And I'm going to unpack that a bit in the next slide. So <coughs> you've got there, it's, um, just to go back, that it's adoption of appropriate information behavior. So perhaps I should just say appropriate there means you know when to use different kinds of behavior. So there are certain times, uh, quite a lot of times, when doing a quick Google search is perfectly appropriate. Appropriate doesn't mean that you have to use long-winded search strategies every time you want information, because that's obviously not necessary. So it's knowing that... Um, when it's uh, a good idea to just put a few words in Google and when you're actually going to have to do quite a bit more than that to satisfy your information need. For example, if it's a serious health problem and you know you want to go to specialist websites, you want perhaps to talk to a person who's expert in the area, you want to talk to someone who's had your particular um, illness, um, so a, a lot more complicated search strategy, that would be appropriate if you're really worried about a health, a health problem. Um, so information behavior, so you're doing these different information behaviors, using the ones that are appropriate to whatever um, need you've got, using whatever channel or medium, so it might be social media, it might be text, it might be talking to people, it might be um, getting information orally through sound, um, and to satisfy your information needs, um, and obviously you'd have various contexts, everyone has various contexts for their information needs. Um, to do with education, if you're in education, or your lifelong learning um, throughout life, um, spiritual information needs, um, information for fun, for work, um, for family, um, to exercise your rights as a citizen, and to your these these needs will obviously develop and change as you go through life, as well. So I'm just seeing whether I missed anything out of the definition. Um, oh I have the bit about wise and ethical use, <coughs> which is also important and tends nowadays more often to come into definitions of information literacy. And you'll probably, if you've had any contact with the information literacy area, you'll know that there's lots of frameworks and standards and definitions. And they have a lot in common with each other. Um, and increasingly, they do mention um, the fact that you need to be ethical in the way that you use information be aware of things like copyright and other legal restrictions, but also be sensitive to cultural differences in what is okay to use in terms of information, what, what information might be dangerous to other people, 
<coughs> and there's sometimes very difficult decisions to be made. So some of the um, very headline grabbing, some of the um, big news stories about uh, information that's been leaked about government secrets or um, things that individuals in, in government have done, um, things that uh, they've done that might be seen as um, uh, problematic in terms of, uh, well, I'm thinking of WikiLeaks and things like that, that the, there are different uh, ethical issues to do there with whether you're endangering a population by revealing the information um, or whether it's a public duty to reveal the information, um, whether you're exposing people who then might get um, more uh, vitriol and possibly you know, physical danger than is appropriate to whatever it is that they did wrong. Um, so there is a lot of issues around when it's uh, appropriate to expose information. I don't think it's a clear-cut area. And so it's being aware of those issues, that it's not black and white in terms of um, when you ought to reveal information and when you ought to keep it secret. <coughs> so that was just to give an idea of what I think, broadly speaking, information behavior means and uh, information literacy and what I'm talking about when I talk about a blended way of working with information. So I'm going to be <coughs> talking about information literacy and Bill and Johnston and I have talked about information literacy being a discipline um, or a subject. Uh, it's not just a set of skills, it's also um, something that people are researching um, and discussing and we certainly feel it's something that every citizen needs to be aware of their own information literacy so that they can um, be more empowered as citizens and also they need to use it in the workplace um, and it's certainly just not just applicable to um, study. So um, <coughs> the Alexandria Proclamation is one of the international proclamations that's been made about information literacy. UNESCO, part of the United Nations, has sponsored a number of meetings in which they brought together experts in information literacy and they produced at the end of it some kind of statement or proclamation um, saying what information literacy means and why it's important. Um, because this is, this is getting into the realms of politics very definitely, um, anything that UNESCO does is bound to be have a political kind of element to it. Um, every single meeting has to bring out its own proclamation. Um, sometimes you um, might think, couldn't they just endorse the one that came out you know, two years ago when they had another of these meetings, but every time um, they have to produce something slightly different. Um, but w one thing that has recurred in some of these statements is, is saying how important information literacy is to people's um, lives as citizens. And so uh, the Alexandria Proclamation, which was made a few years ago in Alexandria with this group of international experts, identified it as a basic human right in a digital world and promoting social inclusion of all nations. So the way in which the UNESCO is talking about information literacy is definitely placing it as something which is important to society and economy and not just, say, for personal learning. So the information literacy concept, which sort of started um, really being uh, evolving from the library side, um, those of you who've looked at information literacy may know that it's commonly um, said to have originated, the term information il il literacy is said to have originated with Paul Zakowski um, in the 1970s. Um, he was at that point the chairman of the um, Information Industry Association, which was the biggest trade association for people in the new online industry. <coughs> and um, he produced a document in which he was saying how everyone had to be information literate. There was a new had to be a new generation of information literates because um, information was expanding so much and in order to cope with online information and the existing information, people had to be trained um, and educated in how to, to meet this need. But that um, online information industry at that point was very much focused on the academic sector, the business online information came along um, as a mainstream thing a little bit later on. So although he wasn't a librarian, um, it was very much connecting with the idea of information being academic kind of information and with a strong focus on textual information. Certainly when Paul Zakowski was talking, textual information was really all you could access online. 
um, because this was the 1970s and the databases. Um, and in fact, I'm old enough to be around to have been around then. Um, and then at the in the 80s, I was involved in actually marketing um, these online databases, which um, were extraordinarily tiny and slow and clunky. And they they really just had text. Um, they didn't have images. So at that point, it was connected with textual information. However, obviously, nowadays, um, apart from the fact that there are um, moving pictures and so forth in real life, um, you've also got uh, online information which is full of pictures and video. And this brings in a need to be information literate with this kind of material, as well as more broadly with different digital environments, um, being able to cope with information coming at you from different directions in all kinds of formats through the physical world and through the digital world and with augmented reality both at the same time <coughs> um, in the same space um, and also being information literate with people because um, most people um, get a lot of information from other people whether that's directly face to face or using other kinds of channels such as email, telephone, um, Skype, uh, texts, um, digital forums or whatever. Um, and information literate both individually and able to work with other people on your information literacy. So one criticism that's come from those in the workplace is that so far the people who've researched information literacy have tended to focus on information literacy in formal education. So information literacy developed in school children and information literacy of university students. <coughs> However, in the workplace, um, one characteristic is that people usually have to work with other people you don't usually work just with information on your own um, and then get rewarded for having worked with it. You usually have to, um, if you do any work on your own in the workplace with information, it's for it to be shared in some way. So you have to learn how to share, how to um, learn about the information culture in your organization, um, when it's appropriate to share information, when it's appropriate to share it outside, how it ought to be presented, how different people in the organization want to have it shared and presented with them and so forth and so on. And so this idea of having more focus on collaborative information literacy, how you're information literate with other people in a team to work jointly on information is certainly seen as being more important. Um, and information literacy in context. So this means um, recognizing that information is different um, in different contexts. So if you're a chemist, um, information for you will include things like molecular structures, um, you'll uh, <coughs> be using specialist databases, you may be using 3D modeling, um, you'll be using perhaps uh, specialist software to do drug discovery. Uh, so all of these tools will enclose information for you. And that will be rather different from, say, if you're studying uh, a language and literature. So someone who's studying the English language and literature, the information might lie in a particular text so if they're a Jane Austen specialist, then um, they might be searching for meaning within um, Pride and Prejudice. Um, there will obviously be commentaries on Pride and Prejudice. There'll be artifacts like the various film um, TV versions of Pride and Prejudice, which might all add to the information space. They might be learning more about the historical um, reality of Jane Austen's time. Um, but it will be different kinds of information there that they would be exploring and wanting to search and keep up to date with than, say, the chemist would be. And so it's important to look at what's important in terms of information and therefore what form would the information literacy take. Similarly, in different countries, um, the information culture will be different and the traditions of how you work with information and some of the national cultural values might also impact these things. Um, so as I've said, some of my PhD students are looking at information literacy in these different cultures. And I'll mention um, Shahad Saltar's um, study. Um, she's from Syria, and <coughs> her study was looking at the conceptions of information literacy of Syrian school librarians. Um, and I'll mention her in relation to also exploring information literacy in conflict situations a little bit later on. So that's certainly one of my big interests, is looking at what does information literacy mean in different environments. So I'm just going to go through a few examples of different kinds of information and also different um, 
studies which have shown the variety of information sources that people are using. So I thought I'd just start first with information literacy and graphic novels. And um, this is a quotation from an interviewee in a research study done by one of my master's students um, a few years ago. So he was a student that was very keen on graphic novels. And so he interviewed some uh, young young men that he um, he knew or got to got those contacts who um, liked reading graphic novels and was asking them about what they enjoyed about graphic novels and also uh, where they saw them fitting in the public library, uh, whether they, they saw libraries having a role in making graphic novels available. And um, so his interviewees identified, for example, that the text is a lot easier, simpler, short, snappy, but you're looking at the pictures and making sense of them, applying the language to them. It sets you thinking a bit more. And I was highlighted that um, quotation uh, because a number of the studies of things like graphic novels have showed it's not just a matter of having simple pictures. Um, the pictures may be read in a very sophisticated way by the people reading the novels. It draws them in. Um, they're obviously not just read by people with low literacy levels. So um, graphic novels are not, not a main uh, reading matter of me, but I do read some graphic novels because I find them entertaining and I do find there's an extra richness in the um, the pictures and the combination of pictures and words. Um, but they have also been shown to improve people's literacy, that people sometimes who aren't interested in um, novels which are just text will be drawn to graphic novels and uh, will be able to get this extra out of them and, um, and improve their general literacy skills. So learning something about the, the language, and I put there um, uh, not some an illustration from one of the interviewees, but um, a Japanese uh, manga, um, that there's actually a literacy in understanding how to read manga. Um, interpreting some of the uh, characteristic signs that you get in manga that mean that someone's really embarrassed or that they're very excited. Um, and so there are certain conventions about the ways that the characters might act and certain, um, whether translating to English or in the original. I can't read Japanese, so I don't know. I can't, I'm not going to pretend that I understand it in the Japanese, but certain kinds of um, sound and things which would represent certain emotions that you get as a, in a conventional kind of way. And also, literally in terms of the layout, um, if they're Japanese manga translated into English, they tend to keep the same layout, which is the reverse um, uh, way of for Western reading. So you read from the back to the front, <coughs> and there's a certain layout of the pages that you need to follow. <coughs> <coughs> and there's a certain flow in the story. So I think it's possible to become information literate in manga, and that would be an extra skill in terms of understanding your information environment and enabling you to communicate with other people who enjoy this. Um, also, uh, one of the first quotation from uh, Shard Saltar's study, as I said, she was looking at the conceptions of information literacy of Syrian school librarians. She carried out her study, um, it finished just before the civil war started in Syria, um, so sh she wouldn't be able to do it um, in the current climate, and she is now um, in the UK. She can't go back to Syria because um, uh, she would be probably killed. Um, so uh, she's here, uh, she's there in the, the UK with her family. <coughs> but fortunately, she managed to carry out this research before this happened. Um, and she was interviewing people who were school librarians. Um, and the situation in Syria with school librarians was a little different from some countries in that there was a law um, that uh, if a teacher became ill, they would become a school librarian. So some of the school librarians in Syria were trained school librarians, and some of them were trained teachers who had become ill, um, had some kind of sickness, and then were moved across to become librarians. And so that seemed uh, an odd situation to me, but it, was, uh, it meant that you had some, very, um, some school librarians who really didn't want to be there because they were actually teachers, and also that they were um, not necessarily um, although they varied in their attitudes, they might, um, because they were ill, feel that they couldn't ver put very much effort into the job. And she interviewed both kinds of school librarian. But you'll see that the um, quotation I put there 
is a school librarian who'd learned more about information literacy and said that it had changed my traditional way of thinking about information. Before I used to see information as only related to text and books. Now information could be a picture, song, music, or it would be a word from the mouth. And so this librarian was talking about how they'd um, been thinking more about information literacy and seeing that it wasn't just about um, text. So the next uh, quotation I've got is to do with health literacy, health information literacy. There's actually a big movement to do with health literacy in some countries, um, a lot more attention on patient empowerment, encouraging patients um, to find out more about their own illnesses, take control of their own illnesses, um, and have more of a dialogue with um, doctors and nurses and hospitals um, when they have an illness and not just feel they have to be subservient to the advice of the doctor, that they can more able to question it. In the UK, um, there is a guideline for health information pamphlets um, and other kinds of literature, um, which sets out what kind of um, language should be used and things to do with layout, making the information accessible to people with um, different kinds of disabilities, for example. Um, and so people can, um, if they think that they comply, if they claim they comply with this standard, they can um, so they can put a mark on their website or on their leaflet to say that they're complying with this standard. Um, and this quote from the Patient Information Forum, which is a uh, obviously, as you might expect, a patient advocacy site, a uh, British patient advocacy site, um, notes that consumer health information isn't just about leaflets and printed information. It's much broader than that. It can be hospital signage, appointment letters, websites, informed consent, personal health records, patient education programs, the list goes on. Good information engages people in their well-being, improves their experience, and enables them and their families or carers to make choices about their lifestyle, treatment, and the services they use. So this is one of the instances of not actually using the word, the phrase information literacy, but it seems to me that you're talking about the organizations who are healthcare providers um, being information literate in the way that they provide information. And obviously, it ideally, you'd have patients who are information literate in the way that they were interacting with the information. But it does put the responsibility on both sides. <coughs> it's not just about individuals um, being information literate, it's about the organizations they interact with also themselves taking an information literate approach. So having information literate universities that are um, good at managing their information, communicating it and presenting it appropriately to the um, students and to the staff that work in the university. Um, it's about governments being information literate in the way that they make information available and not just kind of plonking the information on websites and then saying they've done their duty because the information is available. And so I think that's uh, one of the things that's coming up there is that it's not enough in this context, the health information context, just to say, okay, uh, now our website is compliant with the guidelines for good information <coughs> and the leaflets are compliant with the guidelines. So we've done our bit um, and not think about the whole patient experience, the fact that they are seeing posters, that they might get bewildered when they actually visit the hospital and not be able to find their way around it and so forth. And um, seeing things in the whole picture of the information world that people experience, not just trying to see it in a kind of bitty way. So as I said, health information is a big area of attention because um, most people are concerned about their health or the health of other people. Um, and there is a growing groundswell of um, patients wanting to take more control, as I've said. Um, in this uh, example, I've extracted some information from an article um, by Karen Fisher and her colleagues um, who've done a lot of work in information behavior and in particular information behavior in everyday life outside formal education. And here they were doing a study of pre-teens, um, sort of kind of people about 12 years old, and the way that they were using information. And what I've been trying to pull out there is the fact that these um, young people in the United States of America um, were using a lot of different media to solve their everyday information problems. They were using television, radio, books, magazines, websites, search engines, organizations, um, and very much they were using other people, um, instant message, email, telephone, and face-to-face, 
um, and using all of these things together. So um, as with many other information behavior studies that look at people in everyday life, uh, a lot of information was coming from other people. Um, so in 19 of 25 searches, uh, which they, they were using as their examples, they, they interviewed tweens and asked them to um, think about kind some occasion where they'd wanted information. The tweens used another person as the primary or secondary source of information. So that, again, emphasized how important it is, to me, it emphasizes how important it is to think about being information literate in the way that you approach other people. So um, this might include um, people in your everyday life that you know very well, and so you may not have to think too much about how to um, wheedle information out of them when you want to have it, when you want to get it, so you might be good at getting your, your friend or your parent um, or your child um, to supply the information you want. But in particular, if you're trying to interact um, over the internet or via email in a forum or whatever with someone who you don't know at all or you don't know very well, um, I think you need to have strategies about how to most effectively um, get the information you want from them um, in an ethical way, of course, not misrepresenting what you want. Um, but thinking about how to approach people, what's a good tone to use, or what kind of information you need to supply about yourself to expect to get some information back. So I think just as with um, when you're looking at Google, you need to think about advanced search and knowing the features of Google. It's a good idea to think about, if you're trying to get information from other people, um, what's a good strategy to adopt um, in order to get the uh, information that you require in an ethical manner. Um, I wouldn't probably, I, n I don't know if any of you are going to go into competitive intelligence. There is a, there are jobs to do with the competitive intelligence industry where um, people are trying to get uh, information about what's going on in other country, in other companies, um, so that um, a company can get competitive edge by finding out what their competitors are doing. Um, so that's the idea of competitive intelligence. And I've heard some very interesting talks from people in that industry about how they, um, might phone someone up on Friday afternoon um, because that's when people people's energy is at a low and they might be quite relaxed and quite tired and so they might be more likely to actually give you some information than if you phone the first thing on a Monday morning um, and learning that you need to give them some information to give you the, them the impression that you know more than you do and things like that. So obviously there's an edge there where that borders on unethical use of information, um, and I'm not suggesting unethical use, but as I said, I think it's worth thinking about um, all kinds of information sources, including people. And on the um, end, I've got the quote about how a tween might consult a peer who recommends a website which is vetted by a parent, and ultimately they together consult a store professional. So this is something if they're looking like uh, for a mobile phone or something like that, a new purchase, um, and they might consult another person at the, uh, of their out of their class or something, a friend, um, who recommends an online source. So they're using face-to-face, -face, they're using online, they're then involving um, a different kind of person who has a different knowledge set and also perhaps authority to actually pay for the item that they want bought. Um, and then they're consulting a, another person who's an expert who they don't know beforehand but is an expert in that field. And so that's combining online and offline information, but also using a variety of different personal sources to give different kinds of information. So the peer might be someone who's giving experience of having used that mobile phone. Um, the parent, as I said, uh, might have also some expert knowledge, but also have the money and the um, ability to take you to the meet the store professional. And the store professional might have detailed knowledge of different kinds of mobile phone. In this um, in example, um, one of my another one of my master's students who was looking at uh, people using video games, teenagers using vid video <laughs> games, and asking them about their information behavior and also their attitude to public libraries um, uh, hosting uh, video games. So what emerged in this, and I've had about 10 um, master's students do different studies of um, online gaming. It usually emerges that people are using a lot of different sources to solve problems inside a game um, and to decide whether to buy a game or not. Um, they're using 
the game environment, they're using um, characters and facilities inside the game, they're using, if there's a box or some kind of physical packaging, they're using that um, to find out about the game, they're getting information from friends and family, they're using walkthroughs, which um, those of you who do gaming at all will know that um, as soon as a game is published, someone will have actually gone all the way through it and will have written a, a text explaining exactly how to solve every problem in the game and posted that online for the benefit of everyone else. <coughs> but um, it's interesting, in most of the studies, it emerges that people, most people don't go straight to the walkthroughs, although that would enable them to solve the game's puzzles at once. Um, usually they want to be challenged by the game and to try things out for themselves before they go to the walkthrough. Um, but that's something that people know they can find by Googling review sites where they get different people's opinions, um, different kinds of search engines, forums where they can exchange tips and opinions, and websites. So it's quite a wide variety, again, of information um, sources that people might be polling through to decide where they're going to get the best information. And these kinds of studies also show that people are generally aware of the value of different sources, that they might not trust the forums because they don't know most of the people, or they will um, learn who to trust in the forum by what they, what they see them say over a period of time. Um, they might uh, trust their friends more um, because they interact with them and know whether they're any good at games, whether, whether their opinions are okay, and so forth and so on. And so I've given some uh, quotations there, uh, partly about people learning um, real-world skills, like how to more about how to do camping. This was a younger teenager, um, and how to light a fire, um, and then people interacting within the game to find information. Um, and also what's emerging from many of these studies, um, not just from my students, from other studies of gaming, is the um, people who are creating information um, as part of the information literacy cycle, they're finding information and then they're repackaging it and presenting it to other people. Um, and that's one of the phenomenon, uh, phenomena that um, you see more discussed in uh, information literacy with digital world, um, that it doesn't just include consuming information, there's more and more people obviously creating information because it's so much easier to do that. And many people are doing it all the time without thinking about it too much in places like Facebook or Twitter. Um, an example I mentioned, Second Life, the virtual world, an example from research of buying a virtual sculpture to put in your virtual home. Um, this is from a study where the data was actually collected by my students over s a period of several years. They had to, each of them had to interview someone in Second Life to ask them about their information behavior. So I got about 90 interviews over the pr process of a few years. The students themselves were using it for an assignment where they had to analyze the data. Um, but I also reanalyzed the data. <coughs> and this is an example of someone who had um, had a Second Life home. Um, uh, it was meaningful to her, and she wanted to decorate it, as she might do her real life home with um, a sculpture. And this is, this is a kind of sculpture that kind of changes and pulses. Um, so it's quite pretty to look at. Um, and she was describing her process of, of purchase, that she saw a picture of a sculpture on a blog. So she started on the web, and then she went into Second Life itself and looked around the kind of gallery or shop of the sculptures, um, thought they might be interesting, but she wanted to find out more about what other people thought. And so she was able to, um, I've just shown how you can right click on objects and find out more a bit more about them. And then she Googled the name of the sculptor in Second Life um, to find out more about her. She asked some of her Second Life friends their opinions. She searched on some blogs and actually made contact with more people by wandering around Second Life art galleries <coughs> and um, eventually get gathering these opinions together. Um, and it ended up with her buying the sculpture in the Second Life shop. So again, that was an example of someone using a lot of different channels and media to make a, a decision. Um, an example from the workplace uh, is that of Anne-Marie Lloyd, who started by doing her PhD looking at firefighters and the information literacy of firefighters. She, uh, for that study in firefighters, was um, talking to firefighters in Melbourne, at a station, fire station in Melbourne, 
and she came up with um, a perspective on information, what information literacy meant to people who have fi fought fires. Um, uh, and then she wor moved on to ambulance workers. And in both of these studies, she was emphasizing again that it wasn't just about text and that they were gaining very important information through their other senses. So with the ambulance workers, she actually sort of traveled around with the ambulance workers and then she interviewed them. And she found that they were getting information um, through text because obviously in the medical field, it is very important that people read information. They keep up to date with the field. So they know the latest techniques for um, medical <laughs> um, applications, but also things like the best way of lifting a patient, what the latest equipment is that they might be having in the ambulance and so forth. Um, and so there was initial training, then was keeping up to date, and there were protocols that might be local to the hospital, which were also very important to, to um, comply with so that they could work efficiently and effectively. But then there was a lot of information that they were gathering um, by sound, speech, touch, appearance, movement, and even smell um, to do with the environment. And um, there's an interesting quotation I've given part of there where one of the ambulance workers is describing how they might approach the scene of an accident and how even before you get to the scene, if there's someone outside the scene waving, they call it a waver, um, uh, you know that it's serious because if there's, a really if there's a serious accident, people don't just wait indoors. They actually go outside onto the street and they're watching for the ambulance. And you know if there's someone like that, then it's of a certain level of seriousness. So you start to, um, that's, uh, that's a piece of information for you. And then as you're going into the house, you're, you're looking at the environment. Is there a, a smell in the house, which might mean a dangerous gas or something like that? Or it might just mean that this is a household with very low standards of cleanliness, which also would have an implication for the, the state that the ill patient might be in, the problems that they might have. Um, you're looking perhaps for signs of violence, um, because that's obviously something people, uh, ambulance works, workers are trained to look for, that if, they, if someone's had some kind of injury, um, they are trained to ask questions to see whether it's going to be um, something that was caused by another person in the house um, and so forth and so on. And then getting down to you don't really know what's happening until you get your hands on the patient and can see breathing, feel a pulse, what's the blood pressure, are they pale? So using your knowledge, medical knowledge, and your experience as an ambulance worker, but not um, just kind of combining those to try and diagnose the patient. So. In the case of Anne-Marie, um, who's an Australian uh, researcher, um, when she's finished these studies, she does work with the organisations to try and incorporate this aspect of information literacy into training. So um, mostly beforehand, the training for the firefighters or the ambulance workers has been to do with understanding the protocols or understanding medical background, and she's tried to incorporate more information literacy training, which acknowledges these sources of information which are built up through practice and exchanging knowledge socially um, so that they can be seen as part of training and as I said acknowledged and then developed. Um, they're not kind of hidden skills which you find out about by chance. So there is a practical application of investigating these um, types of information literacy and this is obviously something rather different from uh, a list of information literacy skills that you might get for um, a university course. Um, but I think if you think information literacy is important, which I do, um, it's a good idea to try and prepare people during education, during formal education, to be able to expand their information literacy in the workplace. So they're the ambulance workers observing people, looking at medical instruments and the environment, existing textbook knowledge, seeking new information from people and text on an ongoing way, and this combining, comparing, evaluating, applying, and communicating information is really important to them. <coughs> I'm then going to give um, a couple of examples from crisis situations. So the first is a study um, by done, some done by some American researchers of um, Hurricane Sandy, um, which caused a disaster in um, the USA a couple of years ago. And it was actually a study which was, um, someone had actually been caught by Hurricane Sandy. So it's partly an autoethnographic study. Um, they kept a diary of what was happening, what kinds of information um, they were using um, during this. Um, and then they were comparing it with the literature, reflecting on, on its meaning. 
Um, and I've drawn this out because it shows that information behavior changes um, through different stages of a crisis. And people are reliant on different kinds of information at different stages and obviously have to make the most of whatever's around at the time. So they divided the stages of this hurricane crisis um, into five. So the first one was the warning threats, the point at which they were getting messages through the media um, and then through the internet, if they had access to the internet, telling them there was a hurricane warning, um, instructing them about what they ought to do to try and protect themselves and their property. Um, and then also they might be exchanging information through social media. If you're in an area, you might be telling your friends and your relatives, look, I'm going to be perhaps out of contact because we're about to be st struck by a hurricane and so forth. Um, and if you've got people around you that you can talk to, you might be learning from them or you might have your own experience about um, uh, facing a hurricane before. And then when it was actually happening, um, again, relying on per personal experiences, so uh, other people's knowledge about what you do in a hurricane and what you don't do. Um, at that point, there was still some internet connectivity, and so they were getting some ongoing news information about exactly where it was hitting, um, whether it was going to be about to hit them, whether it was about to pass on and so forth. And then stage three was when it had passed over and basically um, taken out a lot of um, services. So um, a lot of, uh, there wasn't much internet connectiv connectivity, um, a lot of mobile phones weren't working because the um, sort of various points had been hit out and flattened and blown away by Hurricane Sandy. And so at that point it was very much uh, dependent on people um, going out and sort of finding out what had happened um, using their own personal observation, um, going around talking to neighbours, um, starting to assess what had happened to their property, what had happened to other people's property, trying to work out what was going on generally because um, they couldn't contact the outside world. And so they needed to be very really good at working out how do you best network in those kinds of situations. And I think also this is um, identifying that if you know that this is the kind of um, sequence that people might go through in a crisis, thinking beforehand, um, how can I work in advance to set up my own personal network? So if this happens to happen to me, as is, and people generally know whether they're in hurricane sort of prone areas or earthquake prone areas, if this is likely to be a situation for me, what can I do in advance to um, help to have better connectivity if when it strikes? What can I do to try and connect with people or, or gather my own personal information base about what to do in a crisis. So thinking through the information behavior um, beforehand would, I'd say, help you to be information literate in a crisis, realizing you won't have constant contact to the internet and things like that. Then the survival stage where people were gradually trying to pick up the threads of what, what had happened. Um, gradually some there was connectivity to the outside world restored, but still um, not very much physical movement. So part of what they were doing at that stage was finding out would um, help be arriving, um, what was the state of the emergency services. And towards recovery, uh, where more and more people were coming back to normal and getting contact with all the usual services and sources of information in their world. <laughs> so um, picking out a, a, a quotation from that, at stage four, and that was the um, survival stage, Due to the inefficiency of limited accessibility of traditional information channels, personal experiences became the major source of information. Residents sought information through direct contact with their community, neighbors and friends, or walking and driving around the area in search of the functioning gas stations, stores, restaurants, and other types of services. While direct observation might not be considered the most efficient way to seek information, it was often the only way to obtain information, as well as to reinforce the sense of belonging to a community. And I think that last sentence brings in um, kind of another aspect of information literacy that um, it's not just about finding the information, it's about making sense of it in your context and making the best of your particular context. So the second example I'm going to give of crisis information is that Shard um, has been kind of helping uh, people in Syria. She's part of an ac uh, activist network and using social media in particular in a very active way to connect with people in Syria and provide them with help. And this is really at a very simple level. There's much more um, complex examples now that she's um, developed these networks and uh, with other people more. 
Um, but one of the first emails that she got sent was um, simply uh, Shard having helped someone to learn how to use Google Earth. Um, this is connecting back to someone who had been one of her um, interviewees um, for her research study. Uh, I was able to search the best way to escape after I checked with my husband all the way. She told me that she used the internet on Google Earth to find information about the pathways, and that's the pathways of actually getting out of Syria without being getting killed. Um, and I did the same, and I teach other people to do so as well. I'm sorry if I said too much. I wanted to tell you that in our heart that what you teach us is like a matter of life or death. <coughs> and Shard, um, Bill, and I gave a presentation at a conference um, in Limerick earlier in the year in which we were talking more about activism and um, information literacy. And she was talking in more detail about some of the information or the, the real life problems about um, learning how to grow things in almost impossible areas, learning how to generate electricity when there isn't any kind of electricity grid and things like that, um, how connecting up people who knew with, with the people who needed the information and the ways that she was doing that. Um, and she was talking about um, developing active citizenship in Syria um, with a motivation that we lost activists, some of them close friends, because they lacked the required skills and attitudes to deal effectively with information. Um, active citizenship in the Syrian context involves acquiring the skills, attitudes, and social intelligence to be able to support other Syrians with information, information sources, information advice as needed. So she's become a kind of campaigner for information literacy as being a survival skill um, in crisis situations. And I think this also connects with um, Anne-Marie Lloyd's definition um, of information literacy, which she developed after the Fireman study, saying that information literate person has a deep awareness, connection, and fluency with the information environment. Information literate people are engaged, enabled, enriched, and embodied by social, procedural, and physical information that constitutes an information universe. And information literacy is a way of knowing that universe. So um, I'm coming up to the sort of summing up and um, uh, pointing out the uh, kind of implications for education in my last minutes of this talk. So this is about information literacy in context, seeing it in different cultures and communities, different workplaces, different academic disciplines, um, in crisis and in play, and in all these cases, you have diverse individuals in their own circumstances, um, in society, in life, who need to develop their own information literacy to meet those needs. So um, Bill and I have been talking recently about the need to, uh, in education, uh, educate people for situational awareness of information literacy rather than transfer of skills, so that you can't really help people to develop their information literacy for being in a crisis or for being in the workplace um, or just having fun online gaming um, by teaching them a kind of skill list that you tick off. But you need to be aware that you need to develop your information literacy through life. So moving awareness and understanding of your own information literacy to the foreground of information literacy education. Um, understand how you can be information literate with a wide variety of information or information rich environments. So thinking about how your information literate with Wikipedia or YouTube as particular channels, or how you're going to be information literate in using a hospital, um, a multinational company, or a refugee camp. Um, and also, as I've said before, I think there's the kind of reverse of this, that the people running the hospitals, refugee camps, or multinational companies ought to be thinking, how can we be information illiterate, information literate with the people um, that we serve, who are employed by us, and so forth. How can we create an information literate environment for them to exist in? Um, and it requires different learning outcomes and pedagogic strategy in formal education. So teaching an information literacy recipe isn't really enough to meet this. So that means that it's changing roles for library and information professionals and educators. And so Bill and I have been proposing that uh, people ought to be thinking about developing their own curriculum for an information literate life course so that people as individuals are able to reflect on their information literacy in context and think about the changes in their life um, and what that means for their own information literacy. That might mean <coughs> thinking about whether you're having to interact with new kinds of organizations or having new kinds of information need, which mean you need to develop new skills. So you can identify strengths, 
gaps, priorities for your stage in life. So uh, I'm at the older stage in life compared with quite a few of you in the audience. So there's certain um, needs that I might have or interests um, that you might not have earlier in life. So um, I was, in fact, at a very personal level, um, my mother had uh, was an illness. She was um, 91. Um, and I had, uh, she actually died at the end of last year, but there was a huge amount of new information and information needs I had connected with her illness and in helping her through this pro period of time um, that I wouldn't have really even thought about when I was younger. And so I had to try and develop my own information literacy to meet those particular new needs. And I hope I was better at it um, because um, I was aware of the need to think about the information implications of what was happening. <coughs> um, being able to audit your contexts, as I said, to think about what you need at different stages of life, at transition points, and in response to critical events. <coughs> so this is my final slide. Um, so I've tried to emphasize the importance of information literacy in helping us become sensitized to, but not overwhelmed by, the rich information world that we live in. Um, Educators, I feel, should be empowering people to evaluate and use information in the many forms it exists in now. Um, so it's information use of Wikipedia and not banning Wikipedia if you're an educator. Situational awareness of information literacy, becoming aware that being information literate is valuable. Um, so not trying to sneak information literacy um, to students and pretending it's just part of the, the curriculum, but actually um, I think it's important to make them aware that this is something that you really need to uh, tackle and that will be useful to you through life and you need to develop through life. Helping people generate their curriculum VTAR, a course for life. Um, and finally, information literacy as a discipline that helps you um, live your life better or more enjoyably um, to enable life. And so that's the end of my talk. And I wanted to finish with this quotation from another of Shard's um, interviewees, uh, a school librarian who said that information literacy opens my eyes to new horizons which I did not experience before because I was blind. I was not able to see anyone except myself, my thought, my ideas and my life. Information literacy is to think out of the dark box and to see the sunlight. So that's uh, a vision of information literacy that I like to finish with. So thank you, that's it. <laughs> I believe if anyone's got any questions or Comments, um, we've got time for those. Yeah. You speak about blended information behavior. Uh, can you explain the difference between uh, blended information behavior and uh, human information interaction? Um, so the question was the difference between blended information behavior and human information interaction. Inf information interaction. So partly, it's. Um, I try not to do this very much, but I decided academics like to invent new terms because you can then say this is my term and it's all new and so this is one of the few occasions where I, s I, s I googled blended information behavior and no one had used the term before and I thought it was quite neat as a way to describe the fact that many people as I've said are using not just they're not just using databases on their own they're not just using the web on its own they're not just reading text they're actually blending information from all these sources together in order to solve their problem. So I decided to coin that. Um, and so human um, information inter interaction, <laughs> um, I think is probably another term that was coined by some academics at that point in time um, to describe interacting with information. So I don't in fact, I can't remember what the background is and how that's defined exactly. So it doesn't sound to me incompatible, but I suppose it's not emphasizing the, the fact that people are using different kinds of information to solve one problem, um, partly because there are so many more types of information around nowadays um, than there used to be. Um, so it was very co it's been very common for people to um, get information from people and combine it with something from a textbook or newspaper or something um, because these media have been around a long time. But this uh, using online and offline and so forth is a bit newer for everyone. I mean, not everyone, but many people using. So I think it's just trying to hi highlight that. Mm.
any other questions or comments? Yes, I don't know how how long. Ah, yeah, you've got another one. <laughs> um, you speak about information encounters. Uh, uh, I have a How do you how which methodology do you use when you try to research information encounters? Because uh, these situations or events are uh, unexpected, so it's very hard to, to research. But, um, the term information encountering. Um, I took from the research of Sandra Erdeles. Um She published, uh, she did her PhD about this, and she published things in the late 1990s. So the article I read was in 1999. Um, and she just asked people to think whether they'd bumped into information re recently. And this is actually, I've I asked her for her questionnaire that she used on her PhD study, and I've used it with many classes of students. So it asks you to think, what's the last time you bumped into information? And how did you feel about it? And um, do you do this sort of very often or not so often? Um, and so it's kind of self-classification. But very regularly, I've in every class that I've used it with, and I last used it um, the week before last, two weeks ago, um, with an information management class that's mostly Chinese students, in fact. But it was a very similar profile to all the other studies I've done where I think there were two people who said they never picked up information this way. They would never think of kind of acquiring information they bumped into. Um, and that's normal in a class. I usually find there's at least one person who finds this totally bizarre way of acquiring information and a waste of time. And then there were quite a lot of people who did this occasionally. And I think in this class there were eight people who said, yes, I recognize I'm a super encounterer because I, I just count. I do this all the time and I get really excited coming across information. Um, so it seems like it, it's definitely a behavior <laughs> um, that, that, that people recognize when they read about it if they are people who use this kind of behavior a lot. Um, I don't know if that does that answer your question. Yes, I see what you mean. I mean, it's, it's, I think uh, it's memories. On the other hand, that's actual events. Um, so uh, there's a, a lot of conversation you could have about what's real. So I could say, well, anything in experimental of an experimental nature is automatically not real because people are being observed and therefore the behavior is changing. Um, but I, I do recognize the value of experiments. But you also, I think there's been people have done kind of diarying, getting people to just say how they found information during the day. And this kind of thing comes up in that kind of diary as well. Um, that, uh, but I think also it's it's perfectly valid to, um, particularly since many people will remember encountering information that day or yesterday, so it's quite fresh in their memory. And they'll give quite, uh, I ask them to describe it in some detail, so I've got a lot of examples of people um, doing what I was uh, describing, like sitting on the bus and seeing suddenly reading the paper and suddenly seeing something that was applicable to a, a dissertation or something they'd um, they'd handed in last week or um, a travel um, plans that they had for the future um, that they hadn't been thinking about at that moment but they came across the information so and if people haven't got many more questions i don't want to keep people sitting down unnecessarily but i'm looking for some guidance about when I should just stop and say thank you, everyone, and goodbye. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so if you want to give me the guidance by clapping again, that's fine with me. <laughs> unless you, unless you, um, but I don't want to discourage people who do want to um, ask more questions. So I'm deciding that's it for today. <laughs> and thank you very much for attending. And I think that's the end of the session. <laughs>